I would like to, before we sort of broaden this out, um, so we don't get too, so we don't get too too far from the text. Sure. Uh, they do utilize Gramsci a lot, um, mm -hmm. and in a way that you have said that you know, in, in, on your episode on on your show, um, it's a very strange kind of reading of Gramsci that they use. Yeah. Um, what did, so? What was your impression of that? I'm I'm curious because I like I I have I, I think of opinions well, about the way that um, they're in, interpreting him and like leveraging his his arguments, but I'm. I'm curious what you thought. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that is so funny about the way that they use Gramsci um, is that they basically use him to sort of, you know, be like their backup on the idea that like societies are complicated, right? Um, but they completely ignore the fact, um, you know, because that's basically fundamental to their argument, right? Is that using these kind of terms like bourgeoisie versus like working class, right, are unhelpful for politics because it completely obscures all the, the movements that happen in advanced societies, right? Um, and they say, well, look at Gramsci. Gramsci says, you know, these kind of similar um, things as well. But Gramsci also um, can be very clear about the fact that Gramsci is hard to read um, about that you do need to have these kind of total totalizing uh, conceptions for politics as well. Yeah, you know, here's where, how I would, how I have started mm -hmm. to think about this, um, the way that they talk about Gramsci. They utilize Gramsci as being the kind of, he's the good Marxist, mm -hmm. like, oh, there's the terrible, economistic, reductionistic, vulgar, um, technological, deterministic, these other second international Marxists, mm -hmm. but Gramsci, he's the one, he got culture, he got the social, he got the, the social, um, mm -hmm. and not just the economic, and that makes him able to start thinking about hegemony as a, as a cultural and discursive practice, and not just the economic, and so they leverage Gramsci to basically go in this more, um, like the politics of language and discourse and symbolism mm. direction. And what I think is, is kind of fascinating about their, their use of Gramsci is the way that they use him and his attention to culture and the, the social to actually like kind of make the economic world this deeply antisocial, like strange, cold, vulgar place where nothing political or social actually happens. So you have this like this thing called the economy and it becomes kind of nasty to talk about it um, because apparently this is the realm of just like instrumental reason and, and mechanism and, and technology. And, you know, this is so reductive. I think that what Gramsci, if, if I can, you know, I'm not the... Uh, mm -hmm expert interpreter of, of Gramsci, but if, if, I, if I were to take a stab at it, since I don't think Gramsci ever questioned the importance of class politics for a minute in his life, mm -hmm. um, I think he was thinking about workers as robust individuals. He was thinking about workers as having a world that they, in which their working experience was integrated within. I think he was questioning mm -hmm. the distinction between the social and the economic. And he was trying to understand how people were relating to this in his specific context. And so he was trying to break down the distinction between the economic and the rest of social life by understanding it specifically and concretely, which we all need to do. Mm -hmm. um, and they use take this argument to say that the economic is um, almost not, not real or not determinative and they they think that you know society and the social is what's determinative determinative and what matters so they actually instead of developing a more robust view that i think gramsci was trying to develop of mm -hmm. you know these real living people that go into the workplace they have all of their ideas they have their religion they have their intimate lives they have uh, opinions and values and and you, you know they're not just cogs in a machine and he's trying to understand this mm -hmm. and they actually instead of creating a less reductive view they turn it in the other direction and they create the most reductive view possible which is that they aren't constrained by anything these people are not um uh workers are, are not people who are dealing with complications and, and values and really we, we're just going to turn this to the realm of language and culture period. And mm -hmm. so instead of, and so they, and they present this to you, like, 
we're going to have a more robust view of the social and political world. And it actually takes a, a turn in the opposite direction to a more strongly idealist and like uh, folk like focus on culture and, and language. And you never get the integrated view that they that they and many post Marxists insist that that they're trying to give you that they're building. Yeah, it's 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 very disappointing to to see the development there um, and and where post Marxism goes because I do think you know pointing out certain tensions in, in Marxist philosophy is you know I'm not a dogmatist or anything like that it's like you know it's absolutely useful and worthwhile um, endeavor but you don't really get it uh, there despite the really really big um, big claims and you know it, it does seem I mean I'm fairly uh, young, so I, I do not know what the feelings were like for academics in the 90s. But, you know, it was a dark time for folks to start talking and thinking through class politics. It really did feel, I mean, you know, we all know the cliches and the history, stuff like that, right? Um, you know, that it did feel like there needed to be some kind of new synthesis or, or thinking about politics. Um, but then the world really explodes, um, both through a new period of like neo-imperialism uh, with the American adventures um, in the Middle East, um, and then with the collapse of the economic system, that really opens up this kind of political door. Um, and what a lot of people argue filled that, that gap was the rise of, of populism, right? Which hmm, I'm just looking at the clock. That's one of those terms that it's like, I, I hate to even use it because, you know, people use populism and populist to mean so many different things. Um, but maybe just to keep the scope of the conversation sort of contained, um, you look at a kind of revitalization of a different form of left politics, particularly in Europe, right? You see that with Syriza and Podemos um, that is trying to do a different kind of politics that has some aspects of it that are very much like anti-capitalist, um, but they don't build those strong connections with the working class. Um, that would be traditional for socialist parties. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot in there. Like if you were to look from like the, this past decade at that move and, and Leclau, how would you sort of categorize their influence in politics? Um, well, I, I think I'll go back to what I said at the beginning that I would categorize it as a sort of solidification of a common sense that was emerging. Mm. So I think it's the break with the new left mm -hmm. that um, it, it took some of the new left's criticisms of Marxism and radicalized them. And I think that that is, we are still living in Leclau and Mouffe's world yeah. where, and, and I think that um, the, what they do to, to break politics apart from material interests, the way that they make that seem vulgar um, mm -hmm. and, and somehow exclusive and somehow focusing on only privileged people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a fascinating discursive development, but I think that that is, is what has remained ideologically where like we think about those sorts of topics as something separate from the other kinds of cultural articulations that are going on. So we think about these things competitively as opposed to in an integrated way. The other thing that I think is important is that instead of um, trying to find a way to congeal people into a collective political project, um, that lack of faith or the lack of interest or the lack of belief in that classical idea of a social group class or whatever um, in itself that can become for itself, mm -hmm. um, they don't think that's possible. So they lean into the fragmentation and they're like, actually, as I said, we don't, we don't need that. If, mm -hmm. and, and if we don't need that, then we can shed the burdens of this work of doing world building that I think the strength of the Marxist tradition was in doing that world building, mm -hmm. like, um, and by with trade unions and political parties. And contrary to what they try to tell you in the book, these were not just these weird technologically determinist worlds. Like mm -hmm. if you read anything about um, mass trade unions in the United States from the AFL-CIO to the SPD in Germany, people were going to 
clubs and they were dancing together mm-hmm. and they were, they, you know, they were going to church and they were, had community centers. These weren't people who just thought that, oh, we could go to our meetings and then we're driven by the machine and then we all have the same exact interest. And then we, we, um, we, we cast our ballots and that's emancipation. Yeah. These were people who um, understood that there are an incredible range of human values and orientations toward the world. And they understood that what they were doing was creating a world within a world that could act as a collective um, uh, counterpower to what was oppressing them, to what was dominating them. They didn't assume that their constituency was all the same. They knew it wasn't the same, which is why they had to organize each other. And the lack of this common sense, the idea that frat, that any kind of unification or collective life is somehow intrinsically oppressive because you're creating sameness and hegemony as opposed to, um, you know, letting, um, figuring out what you do have in common and what you don't and how you can mm-hmm. accommodate, learn, learn to tolerate each other, um, learn how to balance your your values in a, in a, in a space that, um, you know, where you don't have to take that for granted. And that's why you need each other. That common sense of the old left is what Leclau and Mouf killed. Hmm. Um, So if that's a little polemical. um, No, I think that's great. I mean, like, let me just, you know, paint a little picture because like I spent a lot of time trying to talk to folks because post Bernie, everyone's coming up with the new solution and the new synthesis for what the left should do. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm just like the cranky old socialist over here saying, like, okay, what we need to do is we need to start building strong working or working class organizations, right? And people like that might not be like the most fun answer, but I'll tell you, they're going to be much more vibrant than any kind of new political party that you're going to build in the United States. I'll tell you that right now. But the reason this is important, because I, I try to juxtapose, you know, okay, so in the United States, we throw this Hail Mary, hope that maybe Bernie Sanders can become president. In his own theory, he said, if I come into power, I will not be able to shake the state enough on my own. I'm going to need mass mobilization, right? Um, and people love that because they're like, oh, well, that's because he believes in us. It's like, well, he act like, yes, he believes in you. That's great. But he's also, he has a good understanding of what the state is and what it represents. Let me paint another picture of Syriza, right? Which was the coalition of the radical left. Um, and again, some pe- I have good, uh, you know, Greek friends and lo- people really tried. This was a real attempt. This is not me sitting here saying like, you idiots, you, you know, anything like that. But this is looking at what happened in that history is you get this coalition that comes into power, right? Very radical, very, prog- I mean, what they were saying was a radical break from neoliberalism, right? There's, you can't really criticize the party platform there. But what happens when they come into power? The connections between the base and the party were completely separate. Leo Panitch, who um, is, is somebody who you know I, I reference a lot, you know, makes this great point about how the education minister had this idea that they wanted to use high schools around uh, the country to basically be worker centers, right? To start building that kind of community um, and, and base within the working class. But there became a practical question um, when, when that, that came about was that basically anybody who had any connections to the party had just been brought into government. Right. So they almost completely evaporated, you know, and brought into power their like activist base so that they didn't know who to call. Right. So the intentions even were there from the folks who controlled the state apparatus, but like the actual practical needs to, to implement what they want to do weren't there. And this is one of those um, I, I bring this up uh, because, look, I, I, you know, I definitely think, you know, arguing about policy and, and theory and stuff like that is crucial but this is some of these kind of practical questions that you know are definitely missing in hegemony and social strategy and also a lot of like left discourse around politics right um which is that there's so much fixation it's like okay well how do we break the capitalist you know system like through a certain kind of policy or plan or something like that and forget that you need the the mechanism to do so um and the the real tragedy of the kind of left populist movement um is despite it was trying to uphold folks um, you know, and have like the image and the idea of, of people, it, it didn't successfully mobilize um, people to be able to implement any of, of the radical changes uh, that it wanted to. And in, in MOOF and, and, and uh, LaCloud, it's even worse because um, God forbid that system, like let's say their system actually works, right? And this kind of radical connection of, um, was it the chain of equivalence? 
um, you know, of, of different groups comes into power and then um, they're basically unable to do what they want to do because the theory of, of, of the state and how to interact with it is completely absent. And then once you lose the, the Trump card, which is the control of production that the working class can effectively leverage if organized properly, you know, you just get, you sit in this moment where I could, I just couldn't imagine a more demoralizing moment that like, God forbid, let's say move it and the cloud, right? You whip in like this incredible coalition. Oh, you know, they control Congress and the presidency and it's time for a radical new day in America. And then functionally, you're not able to do anything. I would uh, probably contend too that I don't know how anti-capitalist their philosophy ends up being, but you can imagine how demoralizing that would be. And what a collapse of whatever kind of like what what I think in regular politics is called political capital, but in, in mm -hmm. their framework is called like, you know, a di discursive articulation or something like that. Whatever political capital or discursive hegemony you've acquired on the way up, it's very easy. Like that's the kind of thing that will collapse immediately when people get disillusioned by the fact that you can't help them. <laughs> so the, the, the problem is, is that for, um, for people like post-structuralist writers like this and post-Marxist writers like this, um, domination exists, but we don't know how or why it exists. It just does in a kind of force field of power. Power isn't something that you can amass based on structural leverage or a certain kind of social position or within certain institutions. It's a force field that you're just negotiating. So the idea that you would need specific institutions to give you structural leverage over your employers or against the state um, to work with even with and against the state. Mm -hmm. This is just not a part of the vision that that emerges. And, you know, I just want to add one thing about like, this sounds crazy. Like if you are um, somebody who's reading this for the first time mm -hmm. after post Bernie Sanders, and you're like, wait a minute, like, we don't have the power to like, make our elected, you know, our democratic socialists, we don't have the power to make them accountable to us or to help them do anything. So, you know, we're just like there's a there's a problem of infrastructure here and there's a problem of organization these kinds of thoughts that like when you start thinking how do i how do i get power and, and keep it and, and push mm -hmm. on it um these are the, the kinds of questions that don't occur to them not only because they're not they don't care anymore about having a social constituency they also think about themselves as the social constituency mm -hmm. and i feel like this is a a, a problem that kind of like you can critique the the theory for what it is and how it talks about the world but the more insidious part about it is that when you start thinking about power in such a fragmented socially um just uh what's the word i'm looking for fragmented socially dispersed dispersed mm. way um the people who are capable of articulating the new discourse well they're academics and they're intellectuals so we don't need a constituency because we in the universities are the constituency. And I think that um, the, the more polemical point is like, how, how dare you? Like whenever, like when have, when has that ever been, been true? Um, so, and, and there, and there's this way in which they present the, the culture war almost as being uh, something that they can wage from a position of strength because they're educated. Um, and this is, and for, and so there's this ironic and un, I don't know, uncanny way that they talk about populism. It seems populist because we're coordinating so many different interests. We're inclusive. We're bringing in the margins, mm. but um, I actually think it's, it's the opposite. I, th I think they think that they're in the best position to wage the culture war. Um, and I don't think that benefits any, anyone besides themselves. No, I mean, that is a damning uh, point, but you, you do feel like that, like, you know, essentially that there's so many balls in the air, um, mm -hmm. you know, within their conception of populism that, yeah, only like the super intelligent, well-read academics would be able to hone, you know, this kind of cacophony of, of sound in like one direction. Um, and yeah, I, I, you can see why this is uh, attractive to a certain, uh, group of group of folks.